FFMI or Fat Free Mass Index. A lot of people these days are making YouTube videos and talking about uh, this index and they are trying to use it as a proof that someone specific athletes are actually steroid users. Specifically, they are referring to an article of uh, Corey et al. I've got this article here with me. Uh, it was published in 1995 and uh, pretty much everyone I've seen talking about FFMI was trying to use the data from this article to show how anyone who has a, an FFMI of 25 or higher is effectively a steroid user. I would like to say that people who are using the data from this article, they effectively they are trying to sound scientific uh, and at the same time they are, in many cases, they are misrepresenting the information from this article. I'm an athlete myself and uh, I'm also a physician and I'm also a PhD. That makes me an expert in scientific methods. And today I would like to give you the truth about the article and about the FFMI in general. I'm Dr. Sam, this is Dr. Sam's Health, and today in this video I'm going to show you how to properly use the scientific data from this article and uh, what we can actually do with FFMI. First of all, let's talk about the article itself. In my opinion, as a practicing physician and researcher, I think that the, this article is actually quite useful. It is well designed, and despite all the criticism I've heard, uh, I think it really holds its scientific value. A couple of criticisms that I have heard were related to the inclusion of 20 pre-steroid era athletes uh, data into the article. I agree that this bonus part of the article it has some sort of a questionable source of data, so we don't have to use it. Uh, but I would like to focus on the actual, the, the core part of the article. So what they have done is uh, they have taken two groups of people, two groups of athletes. First group, 83 athletes uh, admitted to having using steroids uh, in order to achieve better physique. Uh, and another group, 74 athletes, were not steroid users. There was some confirmatory drug testing. Uh, in general, I would say that this part is quite satisfactory. One of the major criticisms that was voiced uh, in several videos and several blogs was that the sample size doesn't seem to be adequate. As a researcher, I can say that 83 and 74 uh, are absolutely perfect sample sizes. Effectively, the data that we get from a, any group that has 30 or more participants uh, is statistically representative. Effectively, the distributions of the values that we can get from a group of this size, uh, they approximate something that we call normal distribution, which is one of the major assumptions that we use in statistics. Since this assumption is met, we can effectively use the data from this study for uh, good statistical research. So what did the researchers do? They have taken these two groups of people and uh, calculated their uh, fat-free mass index. The calculation of FFMI is a very simple procedure. It's very similar to calculation of BMI. Uh, instead of using total body mass, you are using fat-free body mass. Uh, and you divide it by the uh, person's height squared. The height is measured in meters, the weight is measured in kilos. The main finding of the study was that people who were non-steroid users had significantly lower FFMI compared to those who used steroids. The average FFMI of steroid users was close to 25, 24.8 specifically, and the FFMI of non-users was significantly lower, it was 21.8, close to 22. A lot of people overlook another statistic that is provided there, which is standard deviation, which is a measure of variability, so how closely uh, do the scores cluster uh, around the mean. Standard deviation is a very important statistic. It is presented in the article and the standard deviation for steroid uh, users was 2.2, standard deviation for non-users was 1.8. In this study, researchers have calculated both means and standard deviations for both groups and they were able to say with high degree of statistical certainty that the uh, fat-free mass indexes are significantly different between these two groups. I think it totally makes sense because people are taking steroids to increase their body mass and it's absolutely not a big surprise that people who are taking steroids have higher um, fat-free body mass and accordingly higher uh, fat-free mass indexes. One of the goals of the study was actually to try to find out uh, if FFMI can be used as a screening tool 
for steroid use. And one of the main conclusions of the authors was that the cutoff point of 25 uh, might be a good indicator that the person has pretty much reached their genetic potential and uh, if someone has an FFMI higher than 25 there is a good chance that they are using steroids. But that's pretty much everything that we can get from this article. Recently a lot of people started talking about this FFMI and that the index of 25 or higher is a clear indication, it's pretty much a proof that the person is using steroids. As a scientist, I would like to say that the data presented in this article are insufficient to draw this kind of conclusion. And the authors themselves claim that FFMI can be used as a good screening tool, not a diagnostic tool. But at the same time, it gives us a wealth of information that we can use in our everyday life. While we're still talking about this article, I would like to show the results, uh, the findings from this article in a graphical form. So uh, I'll show you the distributions of two groups. So we've got means, we've got standard deviations. We know that the sample size was big enough uh, so that the distributions should uh, approximate the normal distribution. So using the data presented in the article, I was able to uh, recreate, reconstruct these normal distributions of the values. That, we, that the researchers have observed in their, in their samples. So please take a look at the picture. We've got two bell curves. One of them is uh, orange and it represents the distribution of the values that we've got in a non-user group. And another one is blue and it is representing the data from the users group. And uh, I've also drawn this red line that represents some random athlete that has an FFMI of exactly 25. I picked the value of 25 just because everyone is talking about this particular value as a cutoff score, something that normal athletes cannot reach and so on. Again, while this article is very informative, it doesn't give us enough information to say that this person is likely or not likely to be a steroid user. But the information in this article actually allows us to place this person somewhere in the distribution of users or non-users. So if we take a look at the, the two curves, we can see that if someone is using steroids and their FFMI is 25, uh, the person is located somewhere in the middle of the blue distribution, of the distribution of users. So it's pretty much an FFMI that, it, that is typical for a steroid user. We can also take a look at the orange distribution, the distribution of non-users, or people who, do, who claim not to use steroids. And you can see that this red line is located quite far to the right of the distribution. And if we use the properties of normal distribution, we can actually uh, say that this person is in the 96th percentile, which simply means that if we take all non-steroid users and uh, randomly pick a person from this group, uh, then this person will be better in terms of their physique than 96% of the people. Effectively, this person is the top 4% in terms of their phys physique performance. Does it mean that the person is steroid user? As a scientist, I have to be very precise. So effectively, all I can say is that this person is definitely a high performer, but I don't have enough information to say that this person is definitely a steroid user. I cannot accuse them of that. I'll give you an example. Imagine that you are taking a test and in the end of the day they say that you are in the 96th percentile based on the test scores. Doesn't effectively mean that you are a cheater. No, it simply means that uh, your test scores are very high and you are top 4% of um, people who have been tested. Is it suspicious? Does it raise certain concerns, especially given that uh, some people are cheating and we know it for sure? Yes, but at the same time, we still cannot say that this person is uh, a cheater. And the same thing applies to our FFMI. We cannot accuse people of using steroids just because uh, of a good performance effectively. Still, a lot of people are trying to use this FFMI uh, index as an indicator of steroid use. They say that your FFMI is higher than 25, it means that you are a steroid user. Since, since I'm presenting the scientific approach today, uh, I would like to reformulate their question. Instead of accusing of anyone using steroids if their FFMI is high enough, uh, I will ask myself a question. 
what are the chances that this person is using steroids if their FFMI index is so-and-so? And again, I will use the value of 25 just because everyone seems to be using it as a cutoff score. I've said already several times that this article doesn't have enough information to actually answer this question. And uh, the missing piece of information is actual prevalence of, of steroid use. Uh, the reason why this article cannot answer this question is because it's effectively something that we call case control study. So they have taken two groups of people. They did not randomly select them. They have taken a group of people who had used steroids, a group of people who did not use steroids, and they compared their FFMIs. Uh, nothing wrong scientifically here, but in order to answer the question, what are the chances of these people using steroids, we need additional information. So I've done some research and I found a very nice article of Siperi and colleagues that describes the incidence or prevalence of steroid use among bodybuilders. Their article is in the description, you can check it out yourself. Also, you can check out the science section of my website, drsamshealth.com. We have a, the digest of this article there. Their main finding is that 18.8% of bodybuilders use steroids, and we will use it to answer our question. Effectively, this question is a standard textbook probability question. Specifically, we're talking about conditional probability. If someone's FFMI is of certain value, what are their chances that they are steroid users? In order to answer this question properly, I will build something that we call probability tree. So let me guide you through this diagram. So the very first step is dividing these bodybuilders into two groups. One of them are steroid users, and another one is those who do not use steroids. So we know from this article that 18.8% of uh, bodybuilders are using steroids, so the chances of randomly picking a, a bodybuilder who is a steroid user are 18.8%. Next step is dividing these two subgroups into those whose FFMI is higher than 25 and lower than 25. So the first branch, the users, will be divided into sub-branches, uh, those who are, whose FFMI is higher than 25 and those whose FFMI is lower than 25. And the same thing will happen with those who are not using steroids. And based on the original article, we can do two things. First of all, we can assign the relative probabilities of these people uh, having their FFMI higher than 25 and lower than 25 based on the fact of them using steroids or not. And the second thing, we can calculate the joint probabilities of someone being, say, steroid users and having FFMI higher than 25 or being a non-user and having FFMI lower than 25, and so on. There are four distinct probabilities. A special note for those of you who are well-versed in statistics is that the sum of all these joint probabilities in the end of the tree, the leaves, or the final branches will be 1. That shows that our calculations are correct. Now we are ready to answer the question. What is the chance of a person being a steroid user given that their FFMI is higher than 25? And all we have to do is just put the data, the joint probabilities that we have already calculated in the end of the tree, and put them into the formula that I present to you below. Based on the data from these two articles placed into this probability tree and into the formula, we can say that someone is 74% likely to be a steroid user if their FFMI is higher than 25. Or we can reverse it and say that if someone's FFMI is 25 or higher, their chances of not being a steroid user are approximately 26%. I think you would agree with me that 26% uh, chance of not being a steroid user is pretty high number and uh, we should not accuse anyone of using steroids if their FFMI is 25, which is effectively the truth I wanted to communicate to you today. It is evidence-based and it's the proper way of interpreting the data. So now it's time to sum it up. The original article is a very good piece of research that gives us enough information to actually have a good understanding of what are the ranges of FFMI uh, among steroid users and non-users. We can definitely use this information to place different people into uh, these distributions and to see uh, how high they are in their distribution, what percentile they are in. 
FFMI can also be used as a screening tool, as the authors of the original articles implied and suggested, but at the same time it cannot be used as a definitive proof that the person is a steroid user. If someone has a very high FFMI, they, they are located in a very high percentile, they are in the top 3, 4, 1 percent of the athletes, we can actually suspect that they might be using steroids, but we would have to do some other tests in order to show uh, whether they are using steroids or not. Also, as I have shown to you, their chances of being steroid users are actually significantly lower than the percentile they are in, and uh, these numbers they actually depend also on the prevalence of steroid use uh, in the population that we are studying. And I would like to reiterate the concrete fact that if someone's FFMI is 25, it simply means that their chances of being steroid users are 74 percent. It's not 95, 99 percent, it's 74. And the chances of not being steroid users are actually 26, which is pretty high, which is definitely below the reasonable threshold of proof. So that's it for today. I hope that it was interesting and intellectually stimulating. I hope that today's video was a good illustration of a proper way of use of scientific data and application of these data to real-life scenarios. If you like my videos, hit the like button, subscribe to see and hear more. Uh, don't forget to check out my website, drsamshealth.com. We've got quite a few interesting materials there. We've got my blogs, uh, references to my videos. We've got references and uh, digest of some research articles. We've got a number of tools that you can use, some calculators. And the last, but definitely not the least, I would like to announce that uh, in a month or two, I'm going to uh, create a probability theory course that will be accessible to anyone uh, who is a subscriber of my website, free of charge. All you have to do is just uh, register and uh, enjoy the course. It will be like a couple of hours long. We'll have a number of probability theory items there, some uh, assignments for you to try new skills. So I promise it will be interesting and intellectually stimulating. And uh, again, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in my next video. All the best.